Yeah, then it's like, <laughs> then it's like oh, wait, I don't know. Questions? Do, do, do. you guys feel like you're tree experts? Can you see the forest for the trees? The tree for the forest. No question? No. Have you used decision trees in your, or you just make your decisions on the fly? All right. Um, on to chapter 12. Boolean algebras. I'll put plural on this. Um, one of my favorite things about teaching linear algebra is when you get to the second week and all the students are all of a sudden realizing that this is not linear arithmetic. You have these matrices and you multiply and you add and you take inverses and you solve systems of equations and they think that's what linear algebra is and it's like this is a 500 level course. We're done in two weeks. Now we're going to do linear algebra. And what was interesting about linear algebra is that word right there, algebra. The idea that as you do things, it has to meet concepts. Remember I say things like a mathematics is toys and rules? What makes an algebra as an algebra is a specific set of toys narrowed down to a specific set of rules narrowed down. So when we talk about Boolean algebras, a Boolean algebra and this idea of not just simply any toy, any rule, it's toys like this and rules like this, if they specifically meet these concepts of a toy that behaves this way and a rule that behaves this way, we will meet its own group and call it a Boolean algebra. The same thing happens in linear algebra. Anything that the toys that are like this or behave like this, and so normally we say things like a vector, right? Most people when they do linear algebra, they talk about rectangular blocks of numbers, right? Or a column of numbers or a row of numbers, right? But on the other hand, there can be things that act like that. And as long as it meets these objects that meet a concept of objects, operations and rules that meet the concept of the operation of rules, it falls underneath the name. So when you take linear algebra, what you're going to learn is the toys can be things like this idea of a vector, a group of numbers that represent that vector, or a continuous function can act like a vector. A polynomial can act like a vector. A matrix can act like a vector. And then you go through all the rules that are associated with that, and so we have things like vector spaces. And So this idea of objects then that meet very specific definitions. For a Boolean algebra, our objects are really just simply restricted to this. B is a set of simply two objects. So I have a set of two things. That's it. Well, what two objects do you want? I don't care. I just need two of them. So in, normally when we talk about this, a lot of times we'll have kind of like a, a visual example to help us. So we could say B is represented by, say, 0 and 1. So I have one object and I have a second object. How could I have represented this? I don't know. I mean, I could use any two symbols I want. But classically, we just pick 0 and 1. We could have had B, 0, B, 1. We could have had A and B, Q, R, just two things. So that's my objects. After this comes the rules. So I'm going to have a collection of only two things, and I'm going to ask, what can I do with all these two things? And what are the restrictions on my rules? Uh, the first is we have two binary operators. What's a binary operator? A binary operator is an operator that takes two objects and spits out one object. An example of a binary operator, when I talk about things like binary operators, say, in elementary arithmetic of ints, what would be things like that? 
1 plus 2 becomes 3. Plus is a binary operator. Um, 4 times 3 is 12. Times is a binary operator. Right? It takes two objects and spits out one object of your group of objects. So the idea of a binary operator, it works on things. And so I'm, I'm going to have two of these. Okay. I need symbols. Uh, I'd like to have an example. You just tell me two binary operators. What do you want to use? We could use things like, I don't know, we could go O plus, we could go O times. We could do a squiggle mark with a circle around it and a, and a hat on top of it. I don't care. There's an operator that works on two things, whatever symbols we pick. So let's pick some symbols. And given that the things that we're working with, we've already dealt with Boolean algebras before. Propositional logic is a Boolean algebra. The Boolean algebra from the beginning of 12.1 is a Boolean algebra, right? Which is things like plus and times. Like the Boolean algebras that you've done in circuits classes, right? That is a Boolean, it's one of a Boolean algebra because you have two objects, zero and one. You have a plus and a times, how you represent it. For us, we're going to use, say, these two symbols, bridge and V. Why? Because I'm borrowing from a thing that I already know is a Boolean algebra. I know propositional logic is a Boolean algebra, so I'm just going to go ahead and borrow those two symbols. We have one unary operator. And uh, it can be whatever we want. Now we've we've done we've had we've had unary operators before in logic. It was not. In other things, we could use things like minus and other symbols that what this thing actually represents. What it does, we'll have in a bit. But we have one unary operator symbolically. This will be the hat, right? It'll be on top of an object. This is not put in front of the object. It is put over an object. <laughs> so we are using the bridge, the V, and the flat hat as our symbols. Okay, what's a unary operator? Works on one thing. Sine, unary operator. Cosine, unary operator. Absolute value, unary operator, right? One thing comes in, one thing comes out. Now we have these operators. such that the following laws hold. And there's five of these laws. First, we have identity laws. All right, first off, how many objects do we have in a Boolean algebra? Two. Two. How many binary operators are there? Two. So what are we saying? The identity laws say this. One of the objects is the identity of one of the operators. The other object is the identity of the other operator, right? So we only have two objects, we only have two operators, so we're just going to pair them off. We are going to say that the V with zero does nothing. The bridge with one does nothing. Well, what if I use different symbols and different objects? Same thing, right? You just pair them off. This guy, we're going to call it zero, is the identity for this operator, then the other is the other's identity. doesn't matter what symbols you have, what you call your operators, one of them is one identity, the other is the other identity. So the identity laws have to hold. Two, complement laws. If you take an object and its complement, If you take a complement and the original object 
and you use the V operator and you look up above and you notice that one was the identity of the AND, then an element V'd this will spit out the identity of the AND. If we go the other way, it spits out the other identity. One is the bridge, right, identity. So if I V, we get the bridge identity. If we bridge, we get the V's identity. Is everybody okay with that? And this is AND and OR when we do logic in terms of what happens, but we have these two laws. Three. We have the associative laws. <laughs> if I would have x bridge y bridge z, it's x bridge y bridge z. If we have x v y v z, it's x v y v z. Association is nice. It says if you have the same um, binary operator through the entire expression, it does not matter how you choose to group. Why do I need grouping though? Why is grouping required? It's binary, right? One thing works on one thing. If I have three objects, it can't deal with three objects at the same time. I need grouping symbols. We also have the, commuti the commutative laws, which would be x bridge y is y bridge x, x vy is y vx. If you have the associative and the commutative laws applying, what that really means is if you have one operator, I don't care about the order at all. Really, that would say what in terms of tree? Since I'm using infix notation on this, I'm writing this down in infix notation. I have to use grouping symbols because the grouping symbols are necessary to tell you the subtree. But if you have commutative laws and associative laws, all of those trees, if, every, if you look through this entire tree and everybody is the bridge or everybody is the V, the ordering doesn't matter. All of those trees would eventually evaluate to the same value as these would collapse down to a single value. So I don't, the subtrees don't matter. So I can completely leave off grouping symbols, not because you get the same tree, but the end result is the same end result. And then the fifth is distributive. Anything that has two objects, two binary operators, a unary operator, that when you study it, satisfies identity laws, complement laws, associative laws, commutative laws, and distributive laws, we will classify as a Boolean algebra. So, as long as it meets all this stuff, it's a Boolean algebra. We've already known them. So, examples. One. Propositional logic. What was our set? 
It wasn't 0 and 1. What was our set for propositional logic? Who represents the 0? False. Who represents the, the 1? True. What were our binary ops? We had x and y, x or y, and what was the unary? Not x, right? And when we go back to propositional logic and you do all of those tables on what these things do, right, is these five laws just, there's more than that, right? But are these five laws met? Yes, these five laws are met. And so because of that, if you go back to chapter one, and you look at the and, the or, well, there's more operators, don't care. I just need and and or, and I need not. Those three operators are all I need, and, or, and not, and I showed that the mm -hmm. identity laws hold, complement laws hold, associative laws hold, commutative laws hold, distributive laws hold. Because all of those laws hold, Therefore, this is a Boolean algebra. So propositional logic is a Boolean algebra. You can make up your own Boolean algebras and give your own symbols. It just simply needs those these things. We need to essentially the three operators, five laws, and two objects. We're good to go. We've made ourselves a Boolean algebra. On the other hand, what about the Boolean algebra that is normally called that, you know, in, for example, circuits? When's the first time you guys ran into this Boolean algebra where you saw things like this? One plus one is one. Digital. Like digital design, right? They use the word Boolean algebra, but the important part here in math, Boolean algebra is actually a bigger word than what they've shown you. What they've shown you from like digital design and circuits was a Boolean algebra using specific elements and specific operators. So for them, what were your sets? Well, they use zero and one. Why? What were these? These were the bits. This was the bit zero and the bit one. Okay, what were the binary operators? They had what? The plus, which is actually what? The bit or. They use a dot symbol. But what is that actually? It's the bit and. These were bits. But they're just simply two elements. Sure, it's the bit zero and the bit one, but it's two elements. They said the binary operator plus the binary operator's dot, which is really the bit or and the bit and. And then what was our unary? Which is the bar, which is the bit what? Complement. And what do we know about these operators? How do these operators work? We knew that 0, 0, 0, 1, 1, 0, 1, 1. What are each of these? Everybody okay with that? Because the bit or is a one bit or one is one. On the other hand, do the same thing. The dot. These are the bitwise ands. One of the what's true about the bits when the and 
in the OR, the plus and times are the same result. When they're both the same. So we recognize some things like that, right? Um, what about the, what is the complement of the bit zero? What's the complement of the bit one? So we know how they work. Now we're calling this Boolean algebra, right? What does it need to be a Boolean algebra? Two objects, I've got two objects. Two binary operators, got them. Unary operator, got it. What are the five things that need to be met now? The laws. So let's check. <coughs> Do those five laws hold? And those five laws are identity, which is x, and we're using plus. All right, um, to go ahead and check these particular things, uh, the easiest way to do it is to do it. How was this done in the early times of, of propositional logic? We had truth tables. So the easiest way for us to do this would be to use bit tables, right? To verify this, we're going to go ahead and use a bit table. What I have x. I don't know what x is. So what bits can x take on? 0, 1. It's a variable, right? So a Boolean variable takes on all values, but there's only two values to take on, so it's easy enough to write. For each of those two rows, what would 0 be? What would 1 be? Now, what would be x bitwise 0? Well, now I can do this. What is a bitwise or 0 or 0? 1 or 0. What would be x bitwise and 1? What is 0 and 1? What is 1 and 1? one. Are those the same? Here's where we don't have biconditional. What we have to do is literally say things that I didn't accept in truth tables when I said the biconditional to show logically equivalent. Now we just simply say, hey, look, these columns are the same in the same situations. And so the answer is yes. And we could go through all five laws. And all five laws on every one of these tables would end up being yes. Right? But when we get to things more complicated, say, um, let's say, which would we use three? Like the distributive laws, right? And if I would do things like x plus, this is where I don't, this is where I really wish that they would never use plus and dot. Because if we use the V and bridge, we're kind of used to that in terms of logic because we have two types of distribution. And if I would write this as Y dot Z, what is this? This is X plus Y dot X plus Z, which is confusing when we look at it in terms of normal elementary algebra, which is not Boolean algebra, right? What you learn in college algebra, elementary algebra, doesn't have two elements, it has an uncountably infinite number of elements, right? It's the real numbers. And we have all these operators and things like that, and we have things like x dot y plus z, and we look at this and say x dot y plus x dot z. Well, that looks familiar. Elementary algebra has that distribution, but on the other hand, Boolean algebra has two distributions. And this top one looks weird. <coughs> And then the book actually does things like, well, if I would borrow, <laughs> if I would borrow from college algebra order of operations, 
I could possibly leave off these parentheses and you would understand that this is actually x plus y being distributed to x plus z and they would write that and you're like, where in the world did that come from? And because, why? but if you leave the parentheses in, it helps you a little bit. But on the other hand, if we would write it this way, with the v and bridge operators, there's no confusion because it's back to what we already did in college algebra. It's one of the things about I disagree about. In mathematics, we get to pick our notation. We can use any symbols we want as long as we agree upon, okay, think about what, what, what is language. I say certain things and it has to bring together to you the same idea. So if they say things like Euler and Euler, people say, well, how do you pronounce it? In the end, it does not matter as long as the sounds that I make brought to your mind the correct idea. Right? That becomes important. <coughs> That's one of the things that we have to be careful with sometimes when you pick a bad notation, like this, not bad, but a notation that can sometimes cause confusion, like this, students all of a sudden become frustrated because they don't realize, but because what do they do? They see it, and what do they try to go to? The ideas of their freshman level, high school level algebra. But that's not the algebra we're doing. We're doing Boolean algebra, which has different distribution. It has two of them. But how would I actually do this? What would I need? I would have to go x, y, z. How many rows for the bit table? There'd be eight. <laughs> and so if we want to start off with zeros, we'd go, go 0, 0, 0, 1, 1, 1, 1, 0, 0, 1, 1, 0, 0, 1, 1, 0, 1, 0, 1, 0, 1, 0, 1. And then what would you do? You'd go over here and then do a bunch of work until you saw eventually a x plus y dot z. <coughs> then you do a little bit of different amount of work. And then you would get a column for x plus y dot x plus z. And then you would have to show whatever's here and whatever's here have to be what? They, did, they better be the same. And if they're the same, distributive law holds. Presenting, they could have, like this textbook could have helped a lot if they just would did something that just did this. Put circles around those. Make those O plus. Just so in your mind, it gets away from college algebra. <laughs> But that has a different operator, right? Right. That's the thing. These symbols have they take on meanings, and we have to be careful. It was great. I was in New York, and we were at Grand Central Station, and we're trying to go somewhere. And then somebody came up, and it was like, "Do you speak Spanish?" In in Spanish, I, yeah, I know enough to say, "Do you speak Spanish?" In Spanish, and it's like, "No." Do you speak French? And, no. And then they pulled out a piece of paper written in Spanish. It's like they're trying to find something, and they're speaking two languages that I don't know. And I'm like, "Hey, I'm glad I have a cell phone." Google Translate's awesome. <laughs> you just say, speak into the cell phone. But they were looking for a church of you know, a particular place, and we you know, worked that out. But this idea of commonality and trying to get that tie for this idea is actually rather, you know, it's, it's common. But we have to be careful. My big warning to you on this is try to keep in mind that you don't want to do college algebra. Too often students just get into that. They fall back easily. And then if we show all of these, you know, are true, therefore, what you were given in digital design is a Boolean algebra. It's not the Boolean algebra, it's an, right? This is, this is in a Boolean algebra. It's one of them. <coughs>